Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is David. I'm a student uh, at Le Wagon. Uh, today, we're having uh, the second Apero Talk organized by uh, Le Wagon Brussels. And we're super happy to have uh, Jeremy Levan <laughs> tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, regarding the format, we have a bit of an hour. So I'm going to ask him a couple of questions and then move on to the Q&A. So don't worry, you're going to take a couple of uh, <laughs> questions from the audience. And luckily, he's uh, having a, a bit of time uh, left, and he's going to stay for half an hour or something like this afterwards, so you can have a proper apro with uh, Jeremy. So let's start by introducing yourself. Mm -hmm. So first of all, you got a degree in design, CID in, uh, in Belgium, and then got another one in California, right? Correct. Um, and then you spent about a year and a half at Seismic and two years uh, working also in design in, um, in Foursquare. Yes. And then what happened happened with a uh, colleague, right? You founded uh, Sunrise. Yes. So in your own words, uh, what is Sunrise? And can you share a couple of metrics? Yes, so with this? Sunrise is a, a calendar, a calendar app. Um, so the, the goal was essentially to reinvent your calendar as you use it today. I mean, everyone has a, you know, a, I mean, on a smartphone, for instance, or even on a Mac PC, there's, the, there's a calendar in installed by default. And so the, the goal, the, the, the idea essentially was to come up with something better because we felt that today, Apple, Google, or I mean, even Google Calendar, they were doing the job and um, even looking at Microsoft on the B2B side. So we kind of you know, dove into that thinking of like, how can we make this better? Something that's totally unappealing, a calendar, you know, usually reminds you of work, boring stuff, um, not necessarily, you know, like concerts and movies and uh, Game of Thrones and really cool stuff you, you want to do at home after work. So we're thinking like, how can we take something that's you know, very personal, m uh, single player, and make it so much better that people would use your product? So we saw, an, we saw an opportunity with Sunrise to essentially redefine what a calendar is. Um, we, we, we saw the opportunity through apps like Instagram and WhatsApp, for instance, um, who were slowly trying to change the landscape because people would go more towards um, three, I mean, third party apps and instead of using the default apps. Um, and so essentially that, that was the, the goal behind Sunrise. Um, so in, in, in terms of metrics, uh, the ones I can share with you, um, so today we, we have about 5 million users signed up. So a lot more downloads because a lot of people download the app without you know, signing up. Uh, on a, on a, a monthly basis, we have about almost less, a little bit less than a million um, active people using Sunrise. And uh, weekly, I think we reached like 200,000 uh, users uh, per week active, week over week. Um, so yeah. OK. What is amazing is Sunrise is a free calendar. So you're not making any money. You don't have any uh, revenue model, mm -hmm. though you managed to sell the company for 100 million to Microsoft. How is it possible? Can we do that in Europe? Or is it just the American dream? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, several things. Um, I think the first thing you should know is, um, well, OK, so we, we got acquired by Microsoft. Microsoft was really interested in Sunrise. Why? Because they know how to sell the calendar. That's what they do all day. They sell Outlook. They sell Exchange. They know very well how much a calendar costs and how much email costs. So they were essentially the best people to know about the value of, uh, of the market. Um, I think sec second of all, um, we focused at first just on the experience because we believed that if you truly nail uh, a, a f uh, an experience, I if it's paid or free, you know, Dropbox, for instance, you pay for it, and it's a really great experience. Spotify, same. Uh, but also free uh, apps just, as just like Instagram, Facebook, or uh, Twitter and, and Sunrise, uh, if you like it and, and if it makes sense for you and if it's so much better than something else you would be using, you, you would probably pay for it at some point, or there would be probably an opportunity. And with the calendar, with Sunrise, well, a calendar is, I mean, it's part of your life. It's, it it encomp encompasses all your um, events. So people's life means, well, it's valuable, so money. So that's essentially how it all came down to you okay. know, the valuation and, and uh, what it means. And also going beyond the calendar, because today a calendar is something very boring. You have to add everything yourself in the calendar. And we felt like, how cool would it be if everything connected to the calendar? So that, you know, you're going on a trip tomorrow to New York, well, automatically in your calendar. You're going to a concert here, you know, um, to, to a venue, well, it's automa aut automatically added to your calendar. So those things, d I mean, don't happen and th they actually don't really exist. So 
we were, our mission became from creating a great single player experience towards something that's you know, multiplayer and also focused on adding all these apps to, to the calendar, which is the center. So, so apparently, with your, your design background, UI, UX was the core uh, success factor to make what happened with Sunrise success today. Um, That's what you are saying, exactly. I, I think also the fact that we could execute with, with a small team. I mean, when we, when we launched Sunrise on, on iPhone, we were, we were three people. When we launched uh, Sunrise on, on Android and, and, and desktop, we were six people. So our team was very, I mean, our goal essentially when Pierre and I, my co-founder, left uh, Foursquare, beh behind you know, developing a product, we also developed a workflow. And that's something very important. Uh, I talked about this with David earlier. Um, there are some workflows out there, you know, lean startup and all that. I don't think you should necessarily use it as a religion. I think it's really about you know, using something that works for you and then shape it towards something that makes sense for your team and yourself. And that's essentially what we did. We saw great things at, at Foursquare. We saw great things you know, in the Valley. We saw great things on blogs. We took all the knowledge and put it in a, in a blender and then came up with our own recipe. So that's kind of like behind Sunrise, the product, we also developed our own way of thinking. OK, cool. So a lot of young first-time entrepreneurs are struggling with finding a good co-founder. Mm -hmm. What happened in your case is that your colleague at Foursquare uh, became your co-founder, right? So how exactly this, uh, this, this combination was the right combination to make a success? Um, can you tell, me, tell us a little bit more about the background of your co-founder? Is more the techie guy or the business guy? What is the, who, was the, who is the Steve exactly in this situation? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I mean, so I came with, with a design background because I'm, uh, I've been designing for mobile for the past seven years, seven, eight years. Uh, Pierre was more of an engineer. He studied, uh, maybe some of you know, uh, Les Ponts, uh, Pont et Chaussée in Paris, uh, engineering school. So he studied programming. And so he was more the, in the engineer, but he wasn't just an engineer. He was an engineer with a design thinking, with design mindset. And he knew that he needed a great designer to build a company. And I knew I needed someone great who understands design and, and development in order to develop uh, a, great, a great team. So we, I, th I think it's you know, kind of like, I guess we were like magnets and got attracted okay. to each other. Okay. Uh, a lot of people also think that they have to move to the U.S., to San Francisco, to, to make it happen. Um, well, you actually moved one time to get another degree, uh, one 2006, something like mm -hmm. that, in California. And you stay there to build your business. So why San Francisco is such a great place? And why, in your case, you actually started a company in New York, whereas we were talking a lot of young entrepreneur, bad entrepreneur moving to San Francisco? And not also Europe, right? Mm -hmm. We see a lot of yeah. nice success in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, yes, exactly. Like, I mean, there are great companies here in Europe also. It's not just about the US. Uh, SoundCloud is from Berlin, for instance. Uh, Spotify is from Sweden. Uh, let's not forget, we, make, we build great things here in, 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 um, in, in Europe and in Belgium, too. Uh, I mean, one of the co-founders of Drupal was uh, from Belgium, too. So there are great things that have been built here in Belgium, and it's not done yet. Um, I think. So why, you know, the value, I and mean, first of all, in my case, I happened to be at, you know, in, in San Francisco when the iPhone came out in 2007. So I came, I was actually not supposed to be there in a way because, you know, it, it all happened to be, and the iPhone came out, and then I was like, oh, this is cool, like, okay, let's try to design something for this. And then eventually, uh, for, for, for myself, I mean, I, I decided, well, maybe I, I, I'd like to explore, you know, the East Coast because, there are essentially two different mentalities going on between the East Coast and the West Coast. The West Coast is obviously like very focused. You know, that's where the valley is. That's where all the big money is. That's where all where you have all the big VCs, VC firms. That's where you you have all the well. That's where the ecosystem exists. Um, and and the big companies. Uh, so it's really easy to take a meeting. You know, you just rent a car and go down to Apple to discuss about the next featuring of your app. So it's super simple. I think on, on, the, on the East Coast, people are, are have, they have a different mindset because it's less techy. It's all about you know, finance, design, art, fashion, social media, uh, agencies, I mean ad agencies. So the, the, the mix of people, artists, so the mix of people in New York is very, the crowd is very different. And personally, Pierre and I decided, I mean, first of all, I decided to go to New York because I was fed up with San Francisco. I was like, I, 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 I'm, I'm over, you know, like geeking out every day. You go to a coffee shop, like people talk about valuations, PC, my startup, this and that, and I was just sick of it. So I was like, you know, fuck this. I'm going to go to New York 
and I want to see how it, how it is in New York. And New York at the time was really small because you had Tumblr, you know, trying to grow, and then Foursquare, and and then eventually. Um, now New York, when you see it as of today, has evolved a lot. I mean, in the meantime, Yahoo had offi has offices now, Dropbox, Google, Twitter, Square, the payments. So there are a lot of big companies who are now established in New York, and they understand that you know New York is now a big uh, talent pool and, and hub. So I would see New York more as, as the future, in a way. But I think it's also um, personally because I prefer New York also because of the people in New York. Um, I'm, I'm kind of fed up with the people in, in San Francisco. Right. I would go there, you know, I still have friends. I mean, don't get me wrong, and I hope my friends won't hate me. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, it's, it's a very diff it's, it's a different mindset. Just like Belgium is different, a different mindset from New York, well, it's the same for San Francisco. And, and I think it's, it's all about, you know, opportunities and where you feel home, in a way. And we felt, well, we're home in Belgium, in France, but also in New York. All right. But wasn't too hard to find investors in your New York instead of San Francisco. The hub of VC are still there. The pool, ta the talent pool of talent, are still in San Francisco. You decided to go to New York, so you don't didn't put all the chances on your side, right? And apparently, you have more than twenty investors with three uh, fundraising. You raised about eight million, mm -hmm. and you got twenty investors. That lo that's a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you manage to get all these investors around the table, aligned with your vision, to invest in a company without any business business model? <laughs> you know, how do you manage? I just got them drunk. No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, I actually, what what happened was, um, well, two things. The first thing is on the East Coast. There are a lot of VCs too. Boston, for instance, you know, you have MIT and Harvard. It's a big uh, talent pool. So to your to your point, actually the Valley is, a, is and San Francisco is very competitive. So I would almost tell you, don't go to San Francisco, because you would go there, you would try to hire someone, he will ask you to get paid a crazy amount, ten times more than what you would pay someone here in Belgium. Um, also, the, it's super competitive, so people would go to you know Google or Facebook or another company rather than your small company because they have free lunches, they have this and that. And all the advantages. And so I think it's actually really hard to build a company in San Francisco because you need a lot of money. That's why you see all these companies in San Francisco raising so much money because they need the money to hire the people because every, everything is expensive. Real estate is, is super expensive now. Uh, it used to be cheaper. Now it's, it's actually uh, higher than, San, uh, than New York. So it's higher. It's living cost in San Francisco is insane. So New York is a great, a great opportunity, um, I think, for, for people to, to start a company. Uh, because it's the US, it's open to, to Europe also. And then to your, to, your to, your, to your question about the investors, how we, how we went, we, well, it all went through intros, introductions. Um, you know, we, we met with some VCs, and they didn't believe in the product. And they, they, would, say, they would tell us, like, hey, you should meet, meet this guy, because he might be interested in Sunrise. And then this is how it happened. And we also sometimes try to just knock on people's door, but that usually doesn't work. Intros are the best, um, that's All what right. I would say. And we had a lot, of, so out of those 20 investors or 20 plus, we, we had a lot of angels too, so they're sometimes easier to get than uh, big VC firms. Did you have any turning point where you had to uh, either stop or continue like, you know, running out of money, like check this, you know, they, they, they were running out of money in a month, they released a front bag, which is totally a different product. Yeah. Uh, were you in this kind of situation at some point? Um, no, we, we were actually fortunate to never run out of money. And another, I mean, advice that you might have heard before, it's always better to raise money when you don't need it. It's actually um, counterintuitive, but that's actually what you should do because when you don't need it, it's so easy to you know, talk to VCs and angels because you don't need the money. So they know that you can walk out, uh, walk away, w rather than you know, when you really need the money. It's so much harder to get, to get it from VCs because they know you are at their feet. So we never ran into that situation. I think it's also because um, what Fred was trying to achieve with uh, Check This and From Back uh, after the B2, going after B2C, uh, you know, photo app and all that, it's, 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 it's not easy. And you're competing against big ecosystems like Instagram, Facebook, mm -hmm. Twitter. So you need a lot of money to, in order to you know, hire people and, 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 and get more people engaged on the platforms. Okay. Before taking any question of, uh, some question from the audience, um, Last question for me. So some people want to start a company in Europe, like Engager, and then they realize that they need funding from the US and move to US. Can we start in Europe and say, by the way, now it's time to move out to, to the United States? 
because in your case you spend like three months coding in Belgium, then you pick up your stuff and then move back to the US, right? And mm -hmm. created the legal entity there. Mm -hmm. So which one is better? Can we can we you know picture both of them? I think there are two things. Well, the first thing is it depends what your goal is. If your goal is to stay in Belgium forever, well, don't necessarily create a company in the US because investors will ask you to be in, in the US. If your goal is to be you know, worldwide or global, we, or you don't really mind you know, New York or Boston or San Francisco, I would rather go with what we did and create a, a, a C Corp in, in, uh, in Delaware. That's the best setup you can do. And it's very classic. You will see it on all blocks. Um, just do that and then you know, go raise money. I mean, it's obviously, it's not that easy to raise money. <laughs> but but, but th essentially, that's the idea um, of you, know, you, you, you want to put yourself in the best position, best situation possible. Um, so I, w I, would, I would recommend what we did. Also because from a m it's kind of marketing, it's a branding thing. You know, you want people from the outside to think that you're a US company, even though you're operating from Belgium. Just like today, Sunrise, well, we're, we're seen as a US company, but we have a lot of engineers in Paris. And we actually just hired two Belgians. They're working from Paris and Belgium. And, and that's totally fine, but people from the outside think, oh, this is cool, this is from the US, and blah, blah, blah. And and obviously, when you know you're up from Belgium, it's maybe harder to to sell because people will, would think, you know, oh, it's not in it's not in English, or it's uh, it's only in French, or it's 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 just for Belgium, or you know. So we're we're trying to 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 approach or to go after a global market. So taking the the U.S. approach was the best for us. All right. Do you have any question from the audience? There you go. Did you decline some investments, or are there bad? So the question is, did you decline any, uh, any investors, right? by investors, people you don't want it because maybe mm -hmm. some of the believers and so on? No, that's, yeah. that, that's a great question. I think you know, money is easy to get. I don't think the m money is a problem. I think money, you could even get it you know, around the corner in a way, you know, different, in different ways. I think the, 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 the hardest part is to find people who will understand you. So VCs or angels who understand your vision, your roadmap, what you're go trying to go after. Um, so essentially people, that, that are aligned with your values. And we, ev y y I mean, we met a couple of people we weren't aligned, um, you know, they had the money, we were interested. It, it was a big fund, you know, maybe in San Francisco, and we're like, oh, this is so sexy. But we didn't take it because in the end, it's all about, you know, human relationships. And we felt like building our company was more about building those human relationships with VCs and investors, rather than just take the money and then leave. But that's us personally. I'd I would say it's, it, it all depends. Did you, did you try to raise money in Europe? Yes, so we the question no. is, yeah, so you have to repeat. No, no. Did you try to raise the question in Europe? That was the question. What was the difference between America, uh, America and uh, Europe? We, so we actually raised, uh, well, so, so we did three rounds. We did the co convertible note, which is quite classic. You, you, con you, you essentially like convert when you do the, the, the next, the next uh, round, which we did with the seed. And this all mostly happened in the US. Uh, our Series A afterwards, after the seed round, happened, uh, well, Balderton invested five million in lo from London in Sunrise. So we, we had investors from London, um, Bernard Liotto, a French guy, um, and we mostly took him. We were talking to people you know, in the Valley, Sand Hill Road and, and such, but we took, why did we take, um, why, we d why did we go with Bernard? Because he was a great guy and we had a great connection with now and I think it's in the end just about the values um, I think just like in the US I think it, it, it really depends on um, they're great they're great um, firms here in the in, in, in Europe like index ventures is one of the biggest ones in, in Europe so they're great great places you can get money from and, and VCs and advisors uh, they're great places in the US also so I think it all depends on what you're building the market you're going for I mean after and and the people you want to connect with and so it to, t I mean, in, to our point, I mean, to my point, I think it's mostly it's mostly about the people, really, because again, like we felt like money is easy to get, um, not just from VCs, but you know, you know just om almost your grandma would give you money. Uh, but we, we we didn't. I mean, we wanted to make sure that every person we bring to the table is actually going to help us leverage and go to the next level. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Um, thank you very much. talking about the values of the company and your values and their 
needing to be a match mm -hmm. between the United States and the Europe Islands, what are they? Um, we talked about the, the functionalities yeah. of the app, but what, are, what, does, what does the app stand for? What's the brand? So, we're, so okay, that's, a, that's a, a great question. Like our, our goal still today is to build a calendar that's human. And we, we, we want to go about technology you know, from a human approach. I think it's, that's the way we thought about you know, bringing design early on. Was trying to we, we, for instance, we had competitors. Tempo was one. Tempo AI, some of you might have heard of it. Of it. Um, we had like, you know, some uh, other ones like you, you might have heard. And we felt like, well, you know, the calendar is not going to be solved with technology, you know, like big data and servers and stuff like that, you know, like crunching data. We felt like, you know, it has to be a human social approach like definitely more um, tailored towards you know us and almost like a person or an assistant who's talking to you and so i think every day today and still the team is a family so i think you know all the way from the product to our team we're trying to keep those uh, human values you know as much as we can like for instance just to give you an idea or you know some examples um, well every year for instance we would invite the entire team to go on a trip and you know just hang out for a week and last, last year we went to Mexico, the year before we went to Berlin. This year we'll go to Barcelona. And we're just taking out everyone, you know, it doesn't have to be fancy or anything. It's more about, hey, let's just have fun together. And we're a family. And things are so much more fun during the day when, you know, when, when, we, when people talk to each other. Because in our past experiences, Pierre and I saw that, you know, sometimes, and some of you might have experienced that every day or still today, people are fighting at work. And it's not fun when people fight because in the end, we all want the same one, but we all want to build the best product. So that's something that was very important for us. We all want the same goal. How can we, you know, like make this as you know, collaborative as possible? Yes. Uh, the, the game of finding investors is, is really tricky sometimes. And um, uh, there's a say in uh, Northern Europe that you meet uh, the, the best investors uh, after working hours. So how does it work on the East Coast? Is it the same? Do, do you work hard during working hours, and then uh, in the evening you get to some places and meet over and, and who persons meet making you meet new persons? Mm. How does it work? So to, to rephrase the education is if uh, networking is important after hours to find investors. Um, uh, well, uh, we had two. I mean, I think I, I believe in two different approach uh, approaches. Sorry. Um, Either you don't know anyone, so just like, you know, I would see people coming to me, like, I'm an entrepreneur in Belgium and I'd like to start my company and I'd like to move to the U.S. And then the first question I would tell them or ask them would be, well, do you know anyone in the U.S.? What's your network? Like, do you just want to go on your own? And so I think it, that's the first, the first approach. Like, if you don't know anyone, try to connect as much as you can. And I think being part of an incubator, you know, could be, uh, you know, uh, tech stars in the U.S. or even Y Combinator or, you know, s even something less fancy. I think as much as you know, as you can learn from that experience and connect with people is great. Um, I think the second approach which we had was we had a, a network in the U.S., so it definitely helped. And since you have the network, it's just like meeting friends, you know, here in Belgium or in in France or whatever, and and you would you know just meet them, and, and it's much easier those connections. But we had to make those connection connections in the first place; they just did not happen, you know, overnight. So I think it's. You, we believed, besides that, those two approaches, we believe in doing rather than talking. So we would build a product and we would tell ourselves we don't go to conferences for 12 months and then we'll go meet people. But we want to build the products first because our users will know that we make a better product. They won't, they won't care or, or know if we go to a conference because that's just for us, right? So you want to build something for the user for the, for the, to make the product better. So we're very product driven and then we, we want to show the result to VCs, for instance rather than show a deck with something that you're trying to build, but you know, it's, it, it's, it doesn't exist, right? Did you wait to a certain amount of users on beforehand? <coughs> to raise? So the question was, if, I, if we waited to, you know, to reach a certain level before raising money, um, well, the first time we raised was very, very early in the process. Um, as soon as we had the idea and started working on it, we had a few prototypes. We would go out and see some friends you know, in San Francisco in New York, uh, in even in Belgium and, and France, and tell them like, "Hey, we have this cool app. What do you think?" And some people would, you know, give us five thousand dollars. So not that much, to be honest. I mean, it's yeah, yeah no, still definitely, but it's not, you know, a million or five hundred thousand or or even ten thousand. I mean, twenty five thousand. So, you know, it's you know, piece by piece, you're building, you know, the 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 the, the house, and you're 
first starting with the foundation. So that's how we started. And then, you know, after we raised, we, di we, we didn't really wait. We were just essentially trying to find the right opportunity. If someone talks to you and is willing to put some money with good terms, you know, it's always good to contemplate the idea and, and talk about it. W would you suggest people to, to quit their job and work on their prototype or MVP one or just do that aside? Uh, what was the case in what was the case with your colleague mm. or you exactly? Yeah, yes, uh, definitely. I th I think, or I mean, I'm someone who is like I guess not scared, but you know, I wouldn't take like crazy risks, even though maybe from the outside it looks like, oh man, this guy did this and this. And actually, you know, I I waited until we had a solid prototype to quit my job. I I mean, I wouldn't just quit my job just because I want to be an entrepreneur. I would do it because it makes sense. So I think that's essentially what you want to wait for until you have an, a right opportunity in front of you and then launch or, 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 or then um, talk to VCs. You don't want to use your cards at the wrong time. So you want to make sure that you're using um, your opportunities in the best way possible. And that's essentially what we're trying to do. Like we stayed at Foursquare. We built a small app, which was just based on an email, which we sent to 30,000 30, people because we built a community, I mean, a small user base um, over time and then After we saw some traction, we were like, hey, we have something. Okay, let's quit our job and do it. But we didn't just quit our job and launch the, the so email. So just based on the ID, because it's a great ID, no, we don't quit our job. Exactly. Right. Just, just like, you know, tomorrow, we have a great ID with Sunrise with it within the company. We wouldn't just launch it. We would, you know, beta test the app. And just what, like, my, some of you might have seen, we just launched a functionality called Meet to help, you know, people, you know, meet each other, kind of like a doodle. Uh, group groups, groups are coming, by the way. Um, <laughs> so, so, so essentially, when we we worked on that for 12 months, almost for a year. So we didn't just launch it; we would, you know, test it and make sure that it's 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 a great experience, so that we're proud of it and not just ship something mediocre. Okay. We have uh, another question over there. Yeah, it was about the meat. Meat? Yeah. How did you come up with the hack? It does. <laughs> Very. Thank you. You mean the keyboard, right? The keyboard. Um, well, two things. The first thing is we're a small team. At the time, we were eight people. So eight, peop uh, eight people team. I mean, even though for to some of you it, look, it might look big, but it's actually very small. Um, we were thinking, wh what's the most, what's the most in impactful um, uh, app or, or feature we could work on as a small team on the calendar? And talking to people, everyone was telling us, like, oh, I need to go back to my computer or my laptop, PC to schedule meetings you know, across you know, my, my calendar. And because I need a big screen, I need to see it on different screens if I'm free on Monday and, and maybe, ha I don't know, I have something with my wife or my, my girlfriend or this and that. And we realized, quickly realized, well, there's an opportunity. Then the second, so that's when we decided to work on Meet because we realized, well, there, a lot of people were asking for something. They didn't ask for Meet, but they, they asked us to solve that problem. How can I schedule something fast on the go on mobile? We're in 2015. How come I cannot do that on my phone? And um, so the second part was, well, we came up with another app, just like you know, Facebook and Messenger, ha they have two, two ha apps. So we came with the terrible idea of building another app outside of Sunrise. And people would hate it. We would hate it. We would go through the email. It doesn't work. I mean, so we went through a lot of iterations and then eventually realized You know, once the, with iOS 8, the keyboard came up, you know, you might have seen those Giphy keyboards with the GIFs and, and, and Facebook has the stickers and all that. And we're like, and one of our, in our engineers came up with the idea was like, I think I can hack the view, the calendar view in the keyboard. And, and we didn't believe him in, in the first place. And then he did it. We showed it to Apple. We sent a screen, I, mean, I, I have a friend who works in the marketing and I sent him a screenshot just like, hey, look what we're working on. And then he said like, oh, it's okay. It's uh, just a PNG, it's, uh, it's fake. I'm like, no, it's a, it's a real app. So the meeting that was supposed to be just one person turned out to be a five-person meeting because everyone at Apple was like, how did you do this? And, and eventually, we, yeah, we kind of hacked the, the way our way around in the calendar, and, and now people love it. So we, we know that, the, I mean, it's kind of changing also maybe the landscape for you guys, developers, um, to maybe hack that view and maybe use it for different purpose. Um, but yeah, so it, 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 it turned out to be a you know, something great for people, so we're very happy. <laughs> It's an open source hack. Yes, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> Obviously, we had to, to work our way around because Apple doesn't necessarily allow it, so you need to, you know, work around it. But we'll take one question there, yeah. right there. Go ahead. Uh, uh, what's the deal with Microsoft? Uh, 
Yeah. So, okay, so what's the deal with Microsoft? Big question. <laughs> Indeed, big question. <laughs> so I, I don't have my tie, but um, no, I'm. <laughs> uh, so, no, no. Microsoft is a great company. I mean, we we had the opportunity to meet. <laughs> no, no, no. Sorry, sorry, just, uh, don't say. No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, we, we had the opportunity to meet uh, Satya Nadella, the CEO. He came to our office, and, and it was great to meet him in person. You know, the, you see a new face behind Microsoft, you know, such an old company. A few few weeks ago, Microsoft turned 40 years old. So it's, it's like a dinosaur. Um, and I mean, everyone knows Microsoft. So it's, it's really interesting to see how Microsoft is changing. And we're kind of part of that change. They embrace iOS, they embrace Android. You no know, people would ask us, like, wait, are you going to work on, uh, on Windows and Windows Phone right now? <laughs> and no, we're not. Because where is the best platform today? Well, it's iPhone and, and, and Android. It's not on Windows Phone. And Microsoft knows that today. So that's why they're slowly trying to you know, buy, acquire some teams and, and, and ideas to build on other platforms. Because they know they, they lost that battle of the market, I mean, of the, of the device. So they, they might still win the App Store and owning a lot of apps. I actually had a slide with all. If you type in, for instance, in um, in uh, the apps for Microsoft uh, Corporation, you see all the apps that Microsoft owns. There are a lot of them, actually. Games, Halo, uh, Skype, Link, Skype for Business, uh, Word, Excel, I mean, plus Sunrise now. So, so yeah, no, there are a lot of apps. And so Microsoft is essentially changing. So we're remaining you know, independent. We're remaining in Soho. I mean, in New York, so we're not moving. They didn't ask us to move to to, to New York and it's uh, to Seattle, sorry. And that's actually you know, quite amazing because they would tell us, hey guys, this is really cool what you're building, keep your DNA, keep doing what you're, what you're doing. And a big company like that, you know, willing to talk and, and listen to a small company like us, 12 people, it's quite remarkable, r remarkable we thought. And you know, when Pierre and I were questioning, you know, should we sell you know, the company to Sunrise? Well, we figured you know, it's probably the best place where Sunrise could land because Microsoft owns a backend. They own Exchange and, and Outlook. They know how to sell a calendar. They're great sellers. They, do, they don't necessarily you know, are great all, way, all the time at execution. They make great products on Xbox. They made a great product with Skype uh, and doing you know, innovation with you know, the, the HoloLens and, and Windows 10. But you know, they needed you know, something refreshing in the calendar space. And that's where we came into the game. So it's, it's, it's I mean, for us, it's very exciting to be part of that big entity while remaining a very small team. Sorry, what's the shareholder structure today of Sunrise? It's, it's all 100% Microsoft. So we're, we're all Microsoft employees. Now. <laughs> <laughs> there. Yes. Uh, what made you think uh, in the beginning when you were at the entering a market where Google and Apple is, in, is a good idea? <laughs> I mean, you were just two people and... Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's a great question. You know, in some ways, it's great that big companies don't innovate as fast as startups. Just like it's great that cabs are doing you know, a bad job and Uber is taking over, um, thank God. Because otherwise, Uber wouldn't exist. And you would go to you know, India, you would use a different cab. You would go to China, use a different cab. And here, it's just one app, boom. So it's great that you, know, you see, you see you know, less innovation in big companies, which is normal because they're so heavy. You know, it's really a heavy boat. And it's, it takes them a while to change you know, their the strategy and, and move all the people. I mean, peop that's essentially why we try to, to keep Sunrise small, because it's so easy to move things around when you're small. Um, one of the drawbacks, in a way, we saw at Foursquare when we grew from, when I joined Foursquare, we were about 60 people. When I left, we were 200 in a year and a half, which is you know, it's quite a, 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 a growth. And so we, we figured you know, moving people is really hard. So, so that's essentially you know, like what makes um, Sunrise, for instance, unique and helps, I mean, it allows us to innovate in the counter space that Google and, 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 and um, Apple wouldn't do. And also because Google, in the end, what do they sell? They sell ads. They s I mean, AdWords, they sell you know, other stuff. They don't sell counter. And same with um, Apple. They, don't, they sell devices. They sell watches. <coughs> they, don't sell, they don't sell the, um, the, the counter. So it's great that they're not focusing on that, so we can. <laughs> Uh, yes? Yeah. yeah you, you talk about your collaborators uh, as a family, actually. Uh, how do you find the family? How do you recruit your family? How do you, uh, yeah. uh, without any uh, you know, public identity, how do you find uh, a really good engineers or designers like yourself? 
It's so, so the question is about recruitment. How do you, how do you find great talents? Basically? It's it's a tough, it's a great and tough question. Um, I mean, like I'm sure, like a lot of you have, you know, asked you yourself, like how 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 do I go about this? I need a co-founder. I need you know an engineer. I need a designer or a marketing person. I think in the end, it's really about. So if you invest early on in people, so let's say you're two, and so at the, at the beginning, Pierre and I were just the two of us. And then we happened to know Joey. He was finishing school, so he was 22 years old. No experience. I mean, he had briefly, he briefly went to Tumblr, but just for a summer, so three months. It's not like he was a crazy engineer from Apple or you know, Google or Facebook. So he came you know, out of nowhere, kind of. He turned to be a great engineer. I mean, amazing engineer, I should say, a, 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 a genius. Um, so Joey helped us, you know, but in the end, what we were trying to do, we were trying to invest in the people that we hired. And so by investing and, and really by you know, helping them uh, become better people, you allow them to, to attract more people. Just like today, um, you know, we, we hired a, a couple of more people. Well, you know, they refer their, their friends because they're like, actually the other day I had one of our employees telling me we were on a trip to Paris to visit the team. He was like, man, I don't know why I didn't join Sunrise <laughs> earlier. And I told him, well, yeah, it's never, it's never too late. But, but I think you know, it, it, it's great to hear that from one of your employees because you really feel that you made a difference. And I'm grateful to work with the people I work today. And I think you know, it's, it's, uh, it's really like you know, you're, you're putting a seed and then you're you know, putting some water every day and, and then at some point it grows. But it's, it's really that. It's really like you need to find great people first that they're, they're not going to screw you over because they're also people in the industry, obviously, like everywhere will screw you over. So find great people who y you can trust. And then slowly, it takes time. It took time to, you know, don't expect, you know, to grow a team to 50 people and everyone will be super happy because scaling people is probably one of the hardest thing to do. You can easily scale servers, but you cannot scale people. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Team, what has been the difference between pre-Microsoft and now post-Microsoft? Because you are all employees now. Uh, is there any difference in, in, in the way you, you manage uh, your team? Because yeah, you are no ma ma if you are all employees, there is no mm -hmm. anymore. So, so the question is: Is there any difference between <coughs> post and pre-Microsoft um, era <laughs> at Sunrise in terms of management? Um, you know, there are two things. The first thing is, well, obviously you would expect there are some changes because you know, you're part of a bigger organization. I mean, Microsoft is about 120,000 people worldwide. So a lot of people uh, compared to us 18 today. So yeah, uh, it's, it's quite a change. But to be honest, we're very removed from that. We're you know, in Soho in our you know, like little you know, nests. And you know, it's, we're still very much in independent. So that's great. That I think Microsoft might have learned from some of the mistakes they did maybe with acquisitions in the past or maybe just looking at, oh, Facebook did this or Apple did this and people left. So I think they're really trying to create a great environment where people would stay. Um, now, I, I also think that you know, they're, they're hoping that we can bring some innovation. And just like you know, we would tell people like, hey, we're using GitHub, we're using Slack. We would bring people from Microsoft on Slack and GitHub because they're like, this is so cool. I want to use the, the tools that the cool kids are using. And and so we, we got you know, people from Microsoft using Slack. And now when they talk to us, well, they have to find us on Slack. And that's the only way they can find us. Uh, because we're, we want them to really embrace and understand how a small startup works. So I mean, from the, from the team towards you, not really from Microsoft towards you, but from the team towards you, as Pierre and, and you, how do we look at that? Is it the same? Is it it's really the same. Okay. Really, it's really just Pierre and myself. I mean, just our titles, you know, we have changed. You know, we're not necessarily like co-founders, if you want. but. I mean, technically, mm. on payroll. But do you have a, uh, some form of freedom to manage your team? Yes, to total okay. freedom. Okay. I think they they're, they're un they understand that the f you know it they they really understood about the DNA. Like, keep your DNA, and please tell us if we if we're if if we're too present. Mm -hmm. So that's great that you know a big company like that would tell you you know it's essentially the sweet spot. Okay. <laughs> yes. One question about the future: uh, Do you want to stay an employee from Microsoft, or do you want to launch your own <laughs> new company in two years and start again? So the question is, what's your next project, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, I mean, it's 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 tough. I mean, there are great things to be. I mean, it's great to be part of a bigger family because now we can leverage so so many things um, at Sunrise. 
uh, because of you know the help of marketing. You know they have like someone dedicated for everything at Microsoft. Compared to before, I would do you know accounting and I would also do some marketing, and Pierre would do partnerships and you know we would do everything. So wearing different hats. So it's great to be part of that. I. I, I think it's 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 going to be hard. I mean, our goal is to essentially stay, you know, a couple of years, and and we'll see what happens. Um, I think it depends on you know e each person's goal. For myself, I'm I'm not sure yet. Uh, I don't know what will happen. You know, who knows? Maybe tomorrow, you know, Microsoft becomes the next Apple, and maybe we you know we can be part of that and and change something. So, we we really see the new Microsoft as a new reboot. You know, when you have that blue screen, and you know you're the screen of dead. Well. You're rebooting the, the 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 PC, and that's essentially what they did. Like it was a blue screen for a while, so they reboot the PC, and now it's in the process. So, so it's great to be part of that and and, and notice. <laughs> okay, we've got a question over there. Yeah. Yeah. What were your personal mistakes, and maybe also the mistakes being a company? So, what is a, a personal mistake? Ooh, <laughs> hitting hard. Right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a uh, <laughs> tough one. Uh, I, you know, I I think. I think sometimes, I think trust, trust is a big one, you know, because, you know, people around you would tell you, be careful of this, you know, because people will screw you over. Uh, and even with Pierre sometimes, you know, and today we have a very transparent and open conversation when we go to work and, you know, when something doesn't go the way we want to, we talk to each other and it's just a conversation. I think in the past, maybe one of the mistakes I did and, you know, we're learning as we're growing, you know, someone would be mad or pissed and then leave the room or, you know, Say something that's not necessarily nice in a meeting, you know, passive aggressive, those things. So how can you, in the end, you know, you're, we went to, through so many uh, mistakes in this regard that we realized, well, how can we make this better? Because we know that the best of Pierre and the best of myself create a, a better person together. So, so we know that, th I mean, in order to run Sunrise and, 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 and make our, our users and, and employees happy. So I think, you know, m trusting people know, like not being too much on them and just leaving them enough room is maybe one of the mistakes I did at the very beginning. And now I'm, for instance, we hired a designer. I'm giving him a lot of opportunities and, and freedom. And he actually does a lot more than, you know, if I was just asking him, like, can you do this, this and that? Because, you know, otherwise he would feel like he's kind of like at school, right? And his mom is watching behind him. And that's not what he wants, especially designers. I mean, they don't want that. I mean, I'm a designer myself. I don't want someone behind me to be like, don't forget this pixel and this and that. And this is so annoying. So really giving freedom, give freedom to, you, to your employees, um, I think is, is very important. I think another one um, uh, I, d I, d I made a mistake was um, sometimes, sometimes you would judge people. You know, sometimes you would think like this person is not, like really believe in the, in the fact that people can change. I think, you know, sometimes it's easy to take things for granted and, you know, if they did one mistake, you know, you would just tell them like, okay, you did one mistake and it's over. I think you sh we sh I mean, and something that we're trying to be better at at Sunrise too is, you know, like give people chances because you can, I mean, everyone, we're humans, we all make mistakes and I think allow mistakes. I think we were at the beginning, we were very focused on not making any mistakes and you happen to make a couple of mistakes because you're so focused and, and stressed about it. So. Yeah, that's very important. How do you handle one million active users uh, with uh, customer <laughs> campaigns and all these kind of things with small teams? Um, so, so the question is about support. How do you handle uh, a million? It's uh, a a million so <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. How do you handle the customers' uh, claims and so on? You know, it's customer service has always been important at Sunrise. Again, like talking about the family. You know, when our third engineer or second engineer joined, we told him, you know what, you're gonna code, but you're also gonna talk to users. So you're gonna code in the morning, and then in the afternoon, you're going to support.sunrise.am, and you're going to reply to users who are not happy about the product, and ask them why. Um, I would go on Twitter, I would handle Twitter, and all people, you know, like, saying this is bad, this doesn't work, this and that, and really try to understand. So this is how we scaled support at first, and the entire team was doing it on a daily basis. So we would assign you, know, oh, you work on Android, this is for you, here's a bug, or this is something I, can, I think I can reply, I can answer. Um, so we would you know, just divide the work, and now that we're growing, well, we hired just someone, that we just hired someone who is doing a, an amazing job, um, and, and he's, he's doing that full time for us, plus the team is still helping him out, because it's, for us it's so important. I think something that's, if you're building a product, the most impor important 
thing you, you, should, you, you should do is really talk to your users because they're the ones using your product. So there will be the, they will be the first ones to tell you that something doesn't work. So usually people would put that on the side and have worked at companies like that. We, we figured, well, you know, let's put that at the center because the user is the most important thing you, you want to keep. All right. Uh, yeah, we're going to take like two or three questions <laughs> uh, top, and then we're going to move on to uh, for the other row. Go ahead. So the question is how to acquire users at the very beginning. Um, a mistake we are uh, talking about mistakes. A mistake we did was trying to optimize too quickly for small use cases. You know, just like you would see those this great blog post about Airbnb telling you like change a copy here and all of a sudden or uh, you know a graph, you know, I mean our users spiked. Really. This is something that big companies can do. You know, at the beginning when you're a small company, you shouldn't be focused on that. You should be focused on building a great product, a great experience not on the tiny little detail. That's something you do, that's something we can do now today, Sunrise, after t being around for two years and a half, maybe. You know, we're start slowly starting to rethink, for instance, the onboarding. You know, how people who don't know about Sunrise or people who know about Sunrise log into Sunrise. And really the experience to add more candidates, something that's very painful on mobile. Sometimes you're in, you know, underground, you don't have signal. I mean, those use cases. So, so that's something very important. Um, like don't focus too much on, on the small things. Uh, and that's a mistake we did. So we, we spent, for instance, a summer, like three months, which is very costly for a small company, right? Three months just focusing on, let's try to, you know, like share this and so that people can share their calendar and all of a sudden we'll get more sp a spike in, you know, people using it or let's focus on this flow and realized, well, you know, it, it doesn't work. So instead, what we did, we, we, we went back to our users and for instance, I would do what I would do. I would query on our users. You know, you, you would you, you would be able to use Mixpanel or one of those tools, you know, analytics, and ask like, show me all the users who are doing this, or you know, the habits and why <coughs> they're not. For instance, people who use Sunrise but only have one account, only a Google. And then you would ask them like, do you really have just one account? Where is your work account? Or why do you only work at your work account and not your personal account? So we would start talking to users, and they would tell us what they wanted, and then we would build it for them. So it's really like trying to get as much as possible from users because they're not going to tell you like build meat, build this. They will just tell you this sucks, this is bad, like fix this. Like I'm not going to use this. This is, blah, blah. and so what you want? You want you want people that you know, you know, tell you that. But you also want people that you know will give you feedback once you built what something that that worked for them. And obviously you, d you don't want to focus on just you know one person. You want to focus on a problem that's for a lot of people. So I, I would say focus on that. All right. Any more questions before uh, drinking? Obviously, <laughs> good. Maybe oh yeah. Wants to Maybe yeah. last one over there. Yeah, last one. At the beginning, you you spoke about the valuation of the company and the, the investors you met at the beginning, and saying that they were uh, really interested in the product, but also the workflow. What kind of workflow do you? What What does it mean exactly? The workflow. Can you give it as uh, an example? Well, uh, I I. I could, uh, by the way, if, if anyone is interested to talk about workflow after this, I, I mean, I, this is like one of my favorite topics. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, that's, you know, how, y how you run and it's, it's so important uh, to get things done, especially as a small team. Um, so the, the question, I don't know if we needed to repeat the question. Oh, yeah, it's about the workflow. Can the you talk yes. about it? Uh, so what does it mean exactly? So the workflow, so the our workflow is very simple. You know, usually people would think, you know, and you would use one of those apps, maybe I use them too, used it too, sorry. Uh, you know email, uh, no, inbox zero. We believe it's not inbox zero, it's email zero. How can, you, how, how can you work in an organization where they send you so many emails and be productive, be good at what you should be doing, coding, designing, marketing, sales, if you get so many emails you know, a day? So what we did, we, we cut the crap and we said no emails within Sunrise. Like colleagues, no emails. Like you would use something else to communicate and so we would use Slack for Instant uh, uh, Slack, by the way, is, uh, in case you don't know, it's a um, instant instant mess messaging system. So it allows you to to, to just chat uh, real time. So we would use Slack, and then another tool we we're using is GitHub Issues. GitHub Issues is you know it allows you to track um, issues and and just like bugs and stuff like that. And and even like you know hey let's let's make let's make stickers or T-shirts for the team. Um, so we would use it for everything. We would again like use that product that was only made for one thing, which is coding, and use it for something else. So what we, what we what we did first was just focusing on being as productive as possible and just focusing on 
OK, I'm hiring one more engineer. How much impact will that engineer add to my company or to my team? Because every person you add to the equation should make, you know, I mean, the output should be bigger, right? And what you would usually notice, and that's what we were also telling VCs, for instance, when you add more people, actually the equation becomes smaller because less comes out of it, lots of meetings. Or also, also one, one of the things we did for a long time, new meetings. Like, you know, if you have something to chat, just put it in GitHub and we'll have the meeting online so that everyone can read it. You're on a different time zone, everyone can read it. It's asynchronous and it works. And so we totally removed the fact of sending emails within the company. We totally removed, obviously Pierre and I would still send emails to, you know, like investors and partnerships and, you know, people outside of Sunrise. But within Sunrise, maybe I send like once a week to Pierre, like, hey, what's up? But, you know, like n not even that. Like it's, it, we, we don't send any emails actually. So, so it's, it's, it's something that, that's very important for us and we're always trying to improve it. So we, we're not saying that we're done yet, but we really like that workflow. And then we use Sunrise to schedule, you know, roadmaps <laughs> and we use our own tools. <laughs> and you own dog food. Right? Yes, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Good. Thank you. And that's it. So thank you very much. Thank you.